Hello everyone. Good afternoon, Molweni Sanbonani Dumelang. If you don't know my name, my name is Professor Mamukheti Pakeng and I'm the Vice Chancellor of UCT. Welcome to this event in honor of South African Women's Day. I extend a special welcome to our friends who are attending from across South Africa and other countries in Africa and around the world. I know that in the room, we've got many honored guests, but I want to recognize um, our Chair of Council, Ms. Baba Longonyama, uh, the Minister of Higher Education also sent an apology and the Chancellor also sent an apology. So we're really delighted that we've got their blessings as we start this event today. We will be celebrating today with music and messages of hope from women who are drawing on their amazing talents, training, education, and personal experience to open up new opportunities for girls and women who live their best lives and help shape the future of our world. Gender equality is still one of the world's unmet human needs. This was true before COVID-19, and it is even more so now as the pandemic takes a terrible toll on the gains women have made in education, the workplace, and the economy. The United Nations predicts that COVID-19 will delay the realization of most gender-related sustainable development goals in East and Southern Africa. A UN study released in March this year reports that women in these regions are more likely than men to end up in extreme poverty child health care services, maternal care for pregnant women, services relating to chronic illnesses and sexual and reproductive health care, including family planning and HIV prevention services, have been limited by the pandemic. Food insecurity has deepened. School closures during lockdown affected 124 million learners across the region, including 15 million in South Africa. Dr. Julita Onabanjo, the regional director of the UN Population Fund in East and Southern Africa, says in the report, we have seen communities that have resorted to negative coping mechanisms, such as child, early and forced marriages. We have also seen escalating levels of domestic violence and abuse. By denying women and girls their prospects and potential, you deny society the opportunity to prosper. Close quote. Gender equality is also losing ground at other socioeconomic levels around the world. The McKinsey Global Institute reported last year that the jobs of career women would be almost twice as vulnerable to the crisis as men's jobs. It said women make up 39% of global employment but account for 54% of overall job losses. One reason for this greater effect on women is that the virus is significantly increasing the burden of unpaid care, which is disproportionately carried by women. This, among other factors, means that women's employment is dropping faster than average, even accounting for the fact that women and men work in different sectors. Now, close quote. The report warns of long-term economic harm if no action is taken to reverse the effect on women's jobs. For instance, without viable childcare options, women may be forced to leave the labor sector permanently. It advises companies and governments to develop policies and interventions to address childcare needs, digital and financial inclusion, and attitudinal biases that prevent women from feeling included in the work environment, especially in leadership positions. While these studies point to the effects of gender inequality, they fail to address its roots. They also overlook the intersectionality of gender inequality. And that is where I believe we need to focus more research and interventions. In 2001, Pratna Patel, the founding director of British Women's Support Organization, Southall Black Sisters Center, and a co-founder of Women Against Fundamentalism, addressed issues of intersectional complexities and multiple forms of discrimination against women in a special report to the United Nations. She said, in the UK, for instance, there is no official policy statement or document which gives any serious attention to the ways in which black and minority women face gender and racial discrimination simultaneously. 
an in-depth analysis of the combined effects of racial and gender discrimination and the implications for all legislation, policies and strategies on the elimination of racial and gender inequality has yet to, has yet to take place. The result is that black and minority women are rendered invisible in official strategies to combat, to combat gender inequality and racial discrimination, and they are rendered vulnerable to further discrimination. This is true across most professional sectors, including higher education. In this country, for instance, women account for only 28% of science researchers. The Mail and Guardian newspaper reported that between 2015 and August 2020, out of 20 vacancies for the post of University Vice Chancellor across South Africa, only four were filled by women. As of the last September, out of the 4,177 researchers with ratings by the National Research Foundation, only 146 were African women. While women outnumbered men in academia in terms of headcount, the Department of Higher Education, Science and Innovation found that black women academics were the most underrepresented group in the sector at 16.1%. Recent research concluded that black women academics in South Africa have trailed behind white women colleagues in terms of pay and promotion. It is interesting, of course, that when debates about transformation are held, there isn't much focus on the number of black South African women who are rated researchers. In my view, it is important that we focus on that as well, because this is a standard national system that all academics, irrespective of their university, race, gender, are evaluated against. Unlike promotion to professorship, which depends on the different criteria that each university uses. But of course, we know the title professor attracts many people and there's comparison between universities, but often the reporting ignores the fact that different universities have different criteria to become professor. At UCT, women represent only 29.79% of professors and 46.12% of associate professors. Among these women, only 3.43% are African, 8.99% are colored, 5.78% are Indian, and 27.62% are international, and 2.14% are undeclared, while 52.03% are white. Now ask for your forgiveness as I use apartheid racial categorizations. I use them because that's the only way we check whether we are making progress in terms of employment equity. My hope is that in the future we will not have to do this because we will have reached a state of equality just even if it's just in terms of the numbers. We've got to make that progress. Looking at the number of African women professors that we, had at, we have at UCT, it makes sense to be concerned that there are not enough of them who are full professors in this university. And that has got to bother us, given that this is the country where Black African, South African professors can practice as full citizens. That's not to say that nobody else is needed. We need the diversity. We need everyone else. But we've got to be concerned that not everybody rises to the level. And that's one of the reasons why this For Women by Women project started. Navigating this kind of intersectionality is like walking a tightrope. It is a holdover from the hierarchy of apartheid, which is no longer legal, but it is very present in our minds. Men and women of my generation grew up under that hierarchy and it still grips us regardless of what race or gender or sexuality we are, what language we speak, what religion we practice. Of course, we can change that way of thinking. Global surveys have shown, for instance, that men who change their views of masculine power to support gender equality tend to experience a greater sense of life satisfaction, deeper connections with their children and partners, better physical and mental health, and even more satisfying sexual relationships with their partners. But as co-authors 
Robin Ely of Harvard Business School, and David Thomas, the president of Morehouse College in the US, as they point out, self-interest should not be the reason for supporting gender and racial diversity. They say, while there is a business case for diversity, one that rests on sound evidence, an expansive definition of what makes a business successful, and the presence of facilitating conditions, we are disturbed by the implication that there must be economic grounds to justify investing in people from underrepresented groups. Why should anyone need an economic rationale for affirming the agency and dignity of any group of human beings? We should make the necessary investment because doing so honors our own and others' humanity and gives our lives meaning. If company profits come at the, at the price of our humanity, they are costing us way too much, and I close quote. If we are to address the intersectionality of gender equality in South Africa, we need to confront this kind of thinking in our daily lives, not in a combative way, the privilege of men. We don't have to um, uh, attend, confront this kind of thinking in a combative way, but to help us all become aware of the kinds of dynamics that are at work in a diverse environment. The tightrope that a black African woman walks as a researcher, as an academic and leader in higher education, is not just about their identity as a woman. It is also about their identity as a black African. Exploring the underlying roots of gender inequality involves digging into our past, but that should not keep us from exploring how we can change things now and for the future. This is why the theme of today's program is social responsiveness and internationalization. Those terms give direction to UCT's work. Social responsiveness speaks to our commitment to apply knowledge to real problems so that we are making a difference in people's lives. And internationalization speaks to our commitment to raise up and empower future leaders who can participate on the global stage and contribute to resolving the problems we deal with as a planet. These leaders include our students, alumni, and staff members, as well as the community members who play such an important role in helping us to see how we can apply research and academic knowledge to address daily human needs. It is not enough to just discuss diversity or give it lip service just to talk about it. Institutions such as UCT need to take specific actions to help change old attitudes about gender and intersectional bias. And it's not just the job of a vice chancellor, it is the job of everyone. Everyone, whether they are head of department, head of an institute, a dean, a DVC, even those of us who are professors and senior academics mentoring young academics and students. As Ellie and Thomas say, leaders must acknowledge that increasing demographic diversity does not by itself increase effectiveness. What matters is how an organization harnesses diversity and whether it's willing to reshape its power structure. So in 2018, I invited women researchers in the university to apply for funding worth a total of 22.5 million rand to conduct research and training that would help us rethink our views of gender in South Africa and give us new insights into ourselves and others in different communities. We awarded these funds in 2019 and since then, we have been accountable to you for these projects because higher education provides a unique platform for developing women's leadership in different professional sectors. An important part of transforming gender roles is to provide role models and opportunities for emerging academics to gain world-class experience. And that world-class experience, they can only gain it from people who have already or are in the process of achieving world-class experience. And hence the selective process of who wins the grants. So it is my pleasure today to introduce to you three researchers who are using the grants that they have won to advance women in their, in, in their respective areas of study. You will also meet some of their students, 
Dr. Katie Altieri of the Department of Oceanography at UCT is working to enable postgraduate black women and transgender oceanographers to become the leaders of oceanography in South Africa and the global north. And Professor Janet Hepgood of the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology focuses on improving our understanding of hormonal contraception for women in sub-Saharan Africa, where the most used injectable contraceptive may actually increase the risk of HIV infection by about 40%. And Dr. Robin Pickering of the Human Evolution Research Institute at UCT is fostering the next generation of black women in human evolution as part of the unit's pursuit of diversity in paleo sciences. I now hand over to these three colleagues, beginning with Dr. Altieri. Katie, over to you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, and happy Women's Day, everyone. So it's my pleasure to introduce the Ocean Women program to you. Ocean Women is a prestigious research and leadership program at the University of Cape Town in the Department of Oceanography. We provide black postgraduate women students with financial support, research opportunities, and career development in the fields of ocean sciences. Our cohorts are the talented women who will transform our department, our university, and lead the future of oceanography. We currently have five Ocean Women Fellows at the moment. We've recently graduated two MSc students, one of whom received a distinction, which is an incredibly rare and very impressive feat. And that student is now staying on as a PhD student here at UCT. We also have had two new students, two new PhD students join the cohort this year. And so we continue to grow the Ocean Women program. Over the past few years, this concept of diversity, equity, and inclusivity in earth sciences has really become a hot topic. Some of you may be familiar with the Twitter hashtag, the hashtag black in, uh, for example, hashtag black in geoscience, hashtag black in marine science, hashtag black in astro. There's also been a variety of seminar series. Every university seminar series now has a focus on diversity in some capacity. Every earth science conference has sessions on diversity and inclusivity in some way. And there have been many up in prestigious publications such as Nature and Science and the Chronicles of Higher Education. A few examples from just the past few months, diversity in science, next steps for research group leaders, achieving diversity in research, gender diversity leads to better science, how diversity makes us smarter, a rapid response to racism in STEM. But the question is, aside from talking and writing, what is actually being done, especially considering how difficult it is to create systemic change? And this is where the Ocean Women Program has really become a leader on the international space in this regard. A few examples I can give you, for those of you familiar with PLOS One, it's one of the largest publishing organizations in science. Um, their diversity, equity, and inclusion series reached out to us to feature a case study on ocean women, to interview some of the fellows and find out how these young black women are actually being supported. The Commonwealth Blue Charter, which is an agreement of all 54 Commonwealth countries to actively cooperate to solve ocean related problems and meet commitments for sustainable ocean development, reached out to ocean women uh, to create a case study as part of their series to share best practices, um, successes and experiences. And they wanted to know particularly how ocean women was created and what lessons have been learned from ocean women such that we can replicate this in other science departments. Meaning, how do we find ways to identify and remove barriers and enable the success of black women in earth sciences more broadly, using us women as an example. Furthermore, National Geographic, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is doing a new piece on decolonizing marine research and conservation. They've also reached out as they want to feature ocean women as a program that, in their opinions, has had some success in actually decolonizing marine research. Although I would say we're very early stages, despite the fact that the rest of the world is seeing ocean women as a leader here, we still think of ourselves as in the early stages of learning, moving forward and finding ways to create the next generation of leaders. We've also been asked to talk about our work at conferences, uh, excuse me, at seminars in the US and Canada and at international ocean science conferences. In fact, this upcoming February, there's a conference session enabled Upwind Sailing, Empowering Women to Transform the Ocean, where ocean women will be featured. And I think the reason that the Ocean Women Program has been asked to um, provide our insights in the international sphere when it comes to these issues 
is because the Advancing Women program actually has real support behind it. And I don't just mean institutional support or the, you know, the pat on the back type of support, but real financial support. And when people reach out and ask, you know, what is it? Why has Ocean Women been able to accomplish something? Why are your fellows? I'm seeing them everywhere. They're on Twitter. They're successful. They're getting distinctions. It's because we can really support them fully in order to give them the opportunities they need to really be successful and overachieve. And so I think that's the, the last message I would leave is that the reason that we're being seen as a leader in this sphere is because of the institutional and financial support from the University of Cape Town and from the vice chancellor particularly. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce, well, we're going to have two pre-recorded videos from our um, fellows, Faith February and Tondo Mazomba. The COVID pandemic brought several challenges and changes to me and my research. My workspaces, office and home, and time were snatched from me without me realizing it or even giving consent. I struggled to bounce back and progress with my research. Fortunately, with the data provision from UCT, I tapped into the night owl option and was supported by the hashtag Cost3AM squad to work on my research before the house would get busy and noisy from around 7am. During the hard lockdown in South Africa, I enjoyed the support of the Ocean Women team and our monthly meetings. It made me realize that there might be other women and girls in need of support during these difficult times. I then became a mentor in Project Kongoza and am now mentoring ladies in Uganda, Nigeria and Kenya, countries which I have never been to. Another internationalization opportunity arose when I was invited by the Old Dominion University to be a panelist for the discussion on diversity, equity and inclusion, how to increase retention in the STEM field. I didn't even know the university existed and wouldn't have been involved had it not been for the opening of virtual borders after the physical borders between countries were closed due to COVID. For my research, I'm using an extensive observational data set to determine the behavior of atmospheric aerosols with changes in environmental parameters. The improved knowledge and characterization of aerosols will lead to enhanced inputs to prediction models for climate change. The pandemic taught me that circumstances can change quickly and it is important to get your research published and to share it with a wider audience so that they too can benefit from it. Thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to wish all the women a happy Women's Day. Today commemorates the day an estimated 20,000 women marched to the union buildings in protest against the legislative control on the movement of black and brown bodies in our country. A powerful movement by women within the intersectionalities they faced during apartheid. That day in 1956 really tells us of an ever relevant truth of us as women in our existence and our presence as global citizens. Our contribution to the sustainable and holistic growth of our country, as well as the global society, has always been an undeniable necessity. As a marine scientist in industry, as well as in the public sector, I am aware that women have endured and continue to endure hardships and challenges within the workspace. But I am continuously encouraged by strong and graceful women who are transforming these spaces, who are setting new standards for men, for women, for non-conforming genders, for everybody. And they do it with fierceness and fearlessness. Women are not just qualified. They are some of the best in their respective fields. They are not just participating. They are leading initiatives, ventures, companies, institutions, policy changes, and really important conversations. I thank you and I celebrate your power and contribution to our growing global society. To those who have walked ahead of me, thank you for carving the path. To those who are coming after me, May the path I carve allow you to endure less, but to be acknowledged and to be celebrated for the unequivocal truth of your worth.
I continue to be inspired by our Ocean Women Fellows every day. Wow. So next, it's my pleasure to hand over to Professor Janet Hapgood. Thank you very much. Hello to all of you, and thanks for tuning in, and happy Women's Day to all you wonderful women. Choice of contraceptive and how different contraceptives may influence susceptibility to infections such as HIV is an under-researched area and particularly relevant to women in South Africa. In my group, we are focusing on two injectable contraceptives. One is called Depo-Provera, which has MPA as the active ingredient. Depo-Provera is the most widely used contraceptive in South Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa. The other contraceptive we focus on is called Neuristorate. This is slightly different and it contains the active ingredient called NET. Now, MPA and NET act like the natural hormone progesterone, but they also have different effects on other systems. A key question that we are asking in my research program is, are the side effects of these two contraceptives similar or different? And in particular, the side effects relevant to HIV infection. One of the drivers for this work, as Professor Peking alluded to, is that decades of observational clinical research have suggested that MPA, but not NET, increases HIV infection compared to no contraception or using condoms only. So this issue is particularly important to South Africa, which is the country with the greatest number of people infected with HIV at over 7 million people. In addition, there is a strong gender bias where more women are infected with HIV than men, and in particular, young women and girls. Also highly relevant to South Africa is, the avail is availability and choice of contraceptives, which has no doubt been even more of an issue over lockdown, with decreasing access to basic health services and more financial constraints and challenges. A novel aspect of our work is the focus on cellular mechanisms and translating and comparing these mechanisms to clinical data. So our work involves doing experiments on samples from women in a randomized clinical trial where women are taking either MPA or NET. So we are looking at the effects of these hormones or these contraceptives on natural hormones and markers of immune function, as well as MPA and NET levels in the samples from these women from two sites, one in KZN and one in East London. What we do is then we formulate hypotheses on what might be happening in the different cells and tissues and perform experiments by adding MPA net to these cells and tissues in the lab to try and understand how things work. So we're looking at the effects of these contraceptives on natural steroid hormones like estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, testosterone. These are natural steroid hormones that you must have heard of, and they're all found in women, and they're very powerful uh, hormones and influence almost all processes in the body. They affect immune function, the ability to fight off infections like HIV and TB, and probably even also COVID. They affect behavior as well, such as libido and sexual behavior, and things like mood and depression. In addition, they also affect metabolism and things like weight and obesity. The effects of all these steroid hormones are carried out by proteins called steroid receptors, which are one of the focuses of our mechanistic work. Thus, you can see why it's important to understand how contraceptives may have different effects on these natural hormones and the consequences thereof. Some of the student presentations that will follow on my presentation will talk more about these aspects. So let me tell you a bit about our teams. So our work involves a strong team of about 10 people at UCT, where 90% are women and 70% are black. We also have several collaborators and other senior key people in South Africa, including at Stellenbosch, KZN and East London, 80% of whom are women and 50% are black. The work also involves an international effort with regular discussions with our overseas partners in the USA. During the last year over lockdown, we have experienced many related challenges, which we have tried to turn into opportunities. These include more planning and writing of papers and theses, growth and development of new personal, social and research skills. 
One of the positive outcomes has been in internationalization with discussions and presentations of research talks internationally in Sweden and USA, attendance of international conferences, all due to the accessibility of the online platforms during COVID. Our project has many important potential outcomes. We have already, in fact, obtained important clinical data showing some similarities, but also some differences between MPA and NET. And we're busy analyzing this data and testing our findings in our cell models. An important outcome of this project is a better understanding of how these contraceptives affect the body, which will inform on choice of contraceptive for women in South Africa. These results will also likely be important for health policies in South Africa and globally, which I'm involved with through my work as an advisor to the World Health Organization. But very importantly, the project has a strong training and mentoring goal where we train our researchers in generic scientific skills, such as development of argument, scientific writing, oral presentation, critical thinking and problem solving. These skills are very important and are translatable to many fields and are absolutely essential for capacity building of women in science in South Africa. This work would not be possible, of course, without substantial funding, for which I give very sincere thanks to Professor Peking and UCT as one of our funders. I will now hand you over to our presentations by postgraduates in my group. Hi, my name is Kim and I recently submitted my PhD and just started a postdoc in the Habgood lab. My research focuses on the different hormones used in hormonal contraceptives and it investigates whether these act differently or the same via the target steroid receptor, which is the progesterone receptor. So steroid receptors are activated by hormones and they regulate an array of different biological responses by activating different physiological pathways. So these can be immune related, metabolism related or cell repair. So given the wide variety of functions that steroid receptors regulate, the regulation of them themselves is especially important. One of the key findings from my research is that some antiretroviral drugs actually activate this progesterone receptor. And this is particularly important because of the number of women using an hormonal contraceptive in conjunction with an ARV. Um, what motivates me during this time and what will continue motivating me during this is the importance of my research on the health of women and the impact this research will have on the future of women in science. During this global pandemic, um, I was unable to access the lab to complete some of my important um, experiments. And so this forced me to readjust my goals and refocus. By doing this, I uh, focused a lot on the current work that I had complete and managed to publish two first author papers. I also then focused a lot of energy on my thesis and managed to submit my thesis earlier this year. So one great thing that the pandemic has taught me is that um, I am able to readjust my goals and actually achieve during unprecedented changes. My name is Nshala Dinkomba. I'm originally from Limpopo province and I joined the Habgood Lab in 2020. My PhD project focuses on injectable hormonal contraceptives and how they may regulate estrogen levels in the female genital tract, which is hypothesized to increase the likelihood of HIV infection. The first year of my PhD was rather challenging as most of it was spent in lockdown where I couldn't access the lab. This has delayed the practical side of my research to a certain extent. However, because I joined this lab from a different field, the time spent in lockdown afforded me an opportunity to familiarize myself with the literature relevant to my project. Estrogen is generally protective against viral infections and changes in estrogen levels has been shown to have an impact on HIV infection, where women with low levels appear to be more susceptible to HIV than women with higher estrogen levels. At the moment, there is preliminary clinical data analyzed by other members in our group over the past year, which confirms that estrogen levels are changed by certain hormonal contraceptives. This is interesting as it informs my hypothesis and directs the work that I do in cell lines. 
Under the broad goal of investigating the possible ways that estrogen levels may be changed by hormonal contraceptives and why this is so, I have been setting up assays that look at different enzymes that are involved in synthesizing and metabolizing estrogens in female genital tract cell lines in order to determine how these are regulated by the different hormonal contraceptives. I personally love basic science because it can be used to study mechanisms on a cellular level which firstly gives us an opportunity to understand how things work and allows us to feed into the library of knowledge that is already present. In this case, illustrating um, the correlation between hormonal contraceptive use and HIV acquisition. Secondly, it affords women the opportunity to make well-informed choices regarding their reproductive health altogether empowering them on how to better protect themselves. Hi, my name is Carla Capitain and I am a master's student in the Habgood Lab. My project will focus on the role of contraceptives on the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone. These are the hormones that are important for the production of estrogen. My project will focus on the mechanism behind the effect that these contraceptives may have on these hormones. This is a gap in the literature that I hope that my project will be able to fill. It is even more exciting as there is a clinical study that my lab is doing and they have found that these contraceptives may be able to influence the follicle stimulating hormone levels in women. Thus, I believe that my project will add important information that could contribute to further understanding how contraceptives are affecting women. The pandemic has uh, motivated me to complete my research. During the lockdown, the production of contraceptives were halted and this prevented clinics from having contraceptives that were already in short supply. In South Africa, this is a large problem as many women depend on contraceptives to be able to control unwanted pregnancies, as many of these women might not have the deciding power over their own reproductive rights. I think this is the case in many abusive relationships and seeing as gender-based violence continued to increase during the pandemic, has only further highlighted the need uh, for access to contraceptives for women in South Africa. Although these issues highlighted during the pandemic motivated me to persevere in my project, the pandemic also highlighted many of my own personal obstacles. I think being a woman in science comes with a lot of pressure to perform at a very high level. I think the stigmas, stigmas associated with the abilities of women, especially in science, definitely have reflected in my journey to become a scientist. One of the obstacles that I was dealing with was uh, my imposter syndrome. So the feeling that I did not deserve to have the position that I had in my academic career. And this was definitely highlighted during the pandemic when I wasn't able to start my master's project on time. And when I returned to the lab, I felt this heightened pressure to succeed at everything that I was doing. However, I realized that I can't be perfect all the time. And the pandemic did give me an opportunity to reflect and understand that mistakes are inevitable and it's important to just learn from them. And I think these lessons that I have gotten from the pandemic will be able to help me succeed in my project. Thank you for listening and happy Women's Day. Hi, I'm Malishova a new mom and a PhD candidate in molecular and cell biology, with my research focused on the safety of progestins that are used in hormonal contraceptives and how they interact with steroid receptors. What makes things interesting here is that the progestins were only designed to interact with a steroid receptor called the progesterone receptor, but studies have shown that the progestins do interact with other steroid receptors. It's suggested that the side effects associated with contraceptive use may be due to this crosstalk. One of my main challenges during the pandemic was trying to finish up the experiments so I could start writing up my thesis. The country went into lockdown and I was trapped in Johannesburg with no access to our labs. To make things even more interesting, throw a baby in the mix. Being pregnant during the pandemic had its own challenges, but once lockdown travel and work restrictions were lifted, I was able to waddle through the lab and finish off my experiments. Juggling a newborn and thesis writing is a daily struggle. But knowing that our research contributes to work that may infer policy changes that ensure women have access to safe and viable contraception options makes it worthwhile, especially knowing that one day my daughter will reap from this labor. Hey, 
Thank you very much to the students. And it's my great pleasure now to hand you over to the third recipient, Robin Pickering. Over to you, Robin. So, Mulweni Dumelang, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and I am excited and honored to tell you about the work that we do at the Human Evolution Research Institute, which we call HERI. And um, what a privilege to share the stage with the wonderful women that you've heard from and will hear from today. So as human beings, we are fascinated with our own origins, and we believe that there's no greater story than that of our own human evolution. Now, South Africa has an almost unparalleled record of human evolution, from the fossil remains of early pre-humans in the cradle of humankind to the oldest emergence of complex modern human behaviors. And until 2015, um, human evolution at UCT had no central home. And it was the vision of Professor Becky Ackman to create an institute where we can kind of have an umbrella over existing research into human evolution at UCT. And HERI became formally recognized in 2016 and draws its staff from the departments of archaeology and geology at UCT and from the Ezeco Museum. So the record of human evolution in South Africa has been the subject of international and local attention for almost 100 years. But the leading researchers have almost always been men, um, almost completely white men and mostly foreign men. So this leaves women underrepresented and black women to all intents and purposes absent. So this means that the power, privilege, um, or power and privilege in our field and access to the fossils, funds, um, have been controlled by foreign white men. And as well as the directions of research and the narratives of human evolution, both within resource and the public discourse. So at HERI, we wanted to go beyond providing an umbrella for human research, human evolution research at UCT and providing things like PhD bursaries. We wanted to disrupt, transform and decolonize these long held patriarchal narratives of human evolution in South Africa and bring real change to our research field. So this goal brought us into a clear alignment with the Vice Chancellor's hashtag Advancing Women initiative and our fortunes as an institute changed dramatically with being awarded this funding in 2019. So with this funding, we, um, our goal of building HERI up into a world class research environment, one where excellence can shine and our Advancing Women Fellows can bring about this change and change the literal face of human evolution research in South Africa. And so we have a three tiered approach. One is through the funding of young black African women. And you will hear more from our advancing women fellows in this segment. Um, and then secondly, to grow our own pool of um, future postgraduates. And this is, and at the same time, address one of the major barriers for women in human evolution, which is fieldwork. So from a lack of outdoors experience and equipment and um, bad previous experiences with fieldwork um, and the prevalence of things like harassment in this often male dominated environment, um, we set out to give the third year students from geology and archaeology, female students, um, a different experience of fieldwork by running a women's only field camp. And um, on this field camp, which we ran with enormous success over the Women's Day long weekend in 2019, we offered the women um, field skills in a informative, safe and fun environment. And you will hear some reflections from some of the participants on this in a moment. And then thirdly, in terms of wider social responsiveness, um, Harry is working with our colleagues at Ezeco um, on preparing a new permanent exhibition on human evolution which will center on the diversity of modern humans today and where this comes from and our deep shared, origi um, shared origins as a species. And we will take on um, topics such as skin color, race and racism in an including welcoming environment and provide a um, additional resource for teachers who grapple and struggle with human evolution as part of the matric curriculum. So how, how is all this going? How well are we um, disrupting, transforming and decolonizing patriarchal narratives of human evolution? Well, it is hard to quantify disruption, but we have certainly been shaking up the field of human evolution 
um, both through our voice and presence on social media, on tackling difficult topics such as um, kind of helicopter fieldwork and um, you know, sovereignty with um, topics like that, and through our work with the museum and this new exhibition. Um, and then when the, I heard about the topic of today, talking about internationalization, my first response was that this is not something we've really been thinking a lot about at here. We've been much more inward looking. How can we, what can we do for ourselves as an institute? But then um, at UCT, we talk about transformation, disruption and decolonization all the time. This dialogue is part of us as an institute. And we have the vocabulary and space to explore practices such as decentering whiteness. And um, Harry has certainly flourished in this atmosphere of transformation at UCT. And I believe that um, both as an institute with Harry and the broader UCT community, we are really blazing a trail here on an international stage. And this is also what Katie was talking about with the um, Ocean Women program, that um, in the, in the world is looking to us um, and we are playing this leadership role. So, um, yeah, in, the, in this way, UCT is really leading the, for, the leading the fray here. So, um, while I have been the main speaker about Harry today, Harry really is a team of people, and I would really like to acknowledge this. And I'm excited to hand over to two of our advancing women fellows and some of our students. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dele Vesini from Botswana. I'm a postdoctoral researcher and an advancing women fellow at the Human Evolution Research Institute. I am privileged to be working with Harry remotely in Botswana due to the current pandemic. My work examines the dynamic social practice through which local communities around heritage sites become exposed in their everyday life to the influx of experts, scientists, and of course, tourists. This cosmopolitan group is involved in and benefits from the construction of heritage and science narratives. Reflecting into the history of archaeological narratives in the heritage program, it is evident that this has been the work and product of outsiders adopted by locals. The archaeological narratives and heritage program are developed from the foundation laid by a hegemonic group of white men privileged with access and resources within a colonial context. These narratives are a product of a work of early travelers, missionaries, traders, and scientists who traversed the African soils studying the African. They maintained the superior position of the intellectual researcher against the inferior subject. The products of this work cannot be separated from the influence of this position while constructing the narrative of the African past. As you can see, there is a natural and strong fit for me and my project within Harry. In terms of social responsiveness, I examine who owns, controls, and uh, constructs the narratives, and why. I look closely at how science influences culture and how culture influences science, and especially whether the background of the interpreter influences the construction of narratives and how society receives these narratives. What I really loved about the Women Only Field Camp is that it was a space where it was safe to speak about issues that sometimes, you know, you would not feel comfortable airing out in a, in a classroom setting. But then at the Women's Only Field Camp, it was really, it, it was so chilled and uh, we're able to discuss and talk about issues that, you know, would most times not be so, you know, open. We, I wouldn't be so open to discuss and to talk about. And then also, uh, what I also loved about the camp was that uh, we were different uh, departments, so the geology department and the archaeology department. It was nice to see uh, people from another department and also hear what uh, they go through in their department and what it's like being in their department as well. My name is Riboni Gokosa a PhD candidate and an Advancing Women Fellow at the Human Evolution Research Institution, which we call HERI, at the University of Cape Town. I am a geologist and my work at HERI focuses on understanding landscape development in Southern Africa. I am fascinated by how our landscapes are and how they have changed over time. 
The main tool I use to do this is cosmogenic nuclides, tiny radioactive particles made in the upper layers of the atmosphere, which slowly accumulate in rocks on the surface. I use these nuclides to date the rocks to understand how long and how they have been exposed in order to determine the rate at which these landscapes they are found in have evolved over time. These nuclides are very small and very rare, so not easy to measure. To do this, I use the only tandem accelerator misspectrometer in Africa and indeed in the Southern Hemisphere. Our take on internationalization comes with a particular focus on Africa and African capacity building, with parts of my master's sample preparation and analysis having been done in the United States. For my PhD work, we intend to have samples from South African rocks fully prepared and analyzed in South Africa. This way, we can ensure that future geochronologists are able to come from Africa, the Global South and beyond to do their research with us and not rely solely on Global North expertise. I take pride in being part of an institution like Kerry, who are contributing towards building African-led research about Africa in Africa and done by women. Geology is a male-dominated field, so for me, being in a woman-centered working environment is different, refreshing and inspiring. At the end of the day, I'm a geologist and I use rocks to understand the history of how the South African terrain has developed, so that in a world full of uncertainty, we can start to understand how our landscape developed so we can predict what our landscape may look like in the future. My biggest memory of the Women's Only Field Camp that Harry conducted in 2019, <clears throat> it was the first one, uh, so the only one I've, be I've been on. And when asked what my biggest memory was, it was quite hard to pick one because we had such an amazing experience the whole time. And I was there sort of as a in a tutor capacity, but I was learning so much the whole time, which was unexpected. So that was a big thing for me. And um, one that seems kind of obvious is the, but it was just rang so sort of true the whole time, was the huge sense of camaraderie between the, the women there and just a feeling of not being judged for, we had like a five hour uh, sexual harassment workshop seminar with Professor Ackerman and it was quite astounding how I've just never been in a in a room with, I don't know, twenty something women and and talking about this stuff quite openly and everyone sharing their stories. Um, and while men are often our allies and and they they wanna learn and, and change and help, there's only so much they can actually like inherently really understand. So it was really, that was the biggest thing for me, was being able to sit there in this workshop with these women for hours and hours and just like really, really feel supported and, and heard. And while it seems a bit cliche, it, the, it was just like hearing these stories and seeing how, how together we really can be and how not alone we, we really are when, when it comes down to it. And, you know, we drafted the a sexual harassment policy um, with Professor Ackerman during that workshop. And yeah, it was, it was great. It gave us a sort of feeling of sense of power and, and hope, which is all we can hope for, really. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Goosebumps all around. Thank you so much to Dr. Altieri, Professor Hepgood, Dr. Pickering, and all the students who have given us a glimpse of the ways women are changing science and scholarship. I just want to say to all the students who came up to talk for their, on their experiences in each of the projects, you are indeed breaking ground in so many ways. Here in South Africa, and as you said, you are showing the world what is possible in an environment that's been uh, marginalizing women's voices. And so breaking ground, I want you to know that breaking ground is not easy because you're walking the path that hasn't been walked by many. And what is important is to keep the focus, keep the focus and more importantly, stay the cause, no matter what happens, stay the course. You are in a much, much stronger position to succeed because you've got outstanding scholars supporting you and you've got all the support that you need from UCT as an institution. So stay the course because we need more of you in this space. Women are also bringing new life to music. 
The Lady Day Big Band is South Africa's first all-female big band, featuring the powerful vocal stylings of Lana Krauster. And I invite you to get out of your seat and sing to their vintage South African pop medley, including Burnout by Sipo Hot Sticks Mabuse, Umkomoti, and Burning Up by Yvonne Chaka Chaka, Dihamba Nawe by Mafiki Zoro, and Destiny by Malaika, and Weekend Special by Brenda Farsi. Enjoy.
South African music and thanks also to the UCT School of Dance. So all those dancers that you saw there are from our School of Dance. Our keynote speaker gives us even more reason to celebrate today. She is living proof of the saying that crowns aren't made, aren't made of rhinestones. They are made of discipline, determination and a heart to find a lawyer called courage. Shurufato Musida is the reigning Miss South Africa 2020. She has demonstrated courage in so many ways, acting against the social norm that a woman's hair is her glory. She shaved her head in 2015. As she told the Times Live interviewer, I realized that I always seek validation through my hair and how I look. I saw a salon and went in to cut the very thing that felt like it stifled me. It was for the freedom more than anything else. It was about finding myself and not looking outside for it. Defying attempts to stifle her freedom is a habit she developed at an early age. In her children's book that she published this year, Shudu Finds Her Magic, she describes how she was bullied for years as a schoolgirl. At times, she felt like giving up because of what other children said about her. Then one day, a special friend told her, you can be anything you want to be. You are perfect as you are. You, are, you just have to be yourself. Shuri Finds Her Magic is being released this month or was released earlier this month by Jakana Books. And I'm very proud to have contributed the foreword to the book. Shuri Fazo wrote the book to provide a way for children to not only hear her story, but to be able to share their own experiences and to find the courage to ask for help, stand up for themselves, and insist on being treated with respect. If we can instill that gift in our children, we will change South Africa for generations to come. Shuru is originally from Hamasia village in the Vembe district municipality of Limpopo, but she moved to Johannesburg for part of her high school education and matriculated from Bryanston High School. She has a Bachelor of Social Science degree in philosophy, politics and economics from the University of Pretoria. And this year, she graduated with an honors degree in international relations at the University of the Witwatersrand. On the night she was crowned Miss South Africa, Shuru made a commitment to start a mindful movement that would inform how we as a society view mental health. She has been working to create conversations around mental health in homes, schools, and in all public forums to abolish the stigma that is associated with mental illness. She hosts weekly Mindful Mondays, Mondays sessions on Instagram in conjunction with the South African Depression and Anxiety Group and Discovery Vitality. And the, on this platform, she and a mental health expert discuss different topics and answer questions from viewers. In addition to being a Brand SA Ambassador and Global Citizen Ambassador, she's an ambassador of the Bookery which sets up libraries in under-resourced public schools. She also advocates for food security because as she says, children can only be their best at school when their basic needs are met. She has addressed global leaders at a United Nations event 
discussing the importance of education for girls and young women and the critical role mental health education plays in equipping young people for the future. Should we be taking her message and example to another global stage this December when she participates in the 70th edition of the Miss World pageant in San Juan in Puerto Rico? Today, we have this wonderful opportunity to hear from this young South African leader who is making such a difference in people's lives. Shudu, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Welcome, the platform is yours. Thank you, thank so, you much so much for the invitation. Sure. And thank you to every single person that is here. I'm very, very honored to be, um, to be addressing you all today. A lot of people ask me what it means to be in South Africa. I get asked what a beauty contest for anyway. I'm sure many of you are wondering why a beauty queen has been invited as a guest speaker at a Women's Day event hosted by the best university in Africa. Beauty pageants have long been contested as part of our culture. Some people see them as a hangover from a far more patriarchal era, while others defend them for helping women of all ages to feel more confident, to know their self-worth and make a contribution in areas that they feel passionate about. The debate continues. I'm grateful for the opportunity that being crowned Miss South Africa has given me. Opportunities that I would have never have dreamed of growing up in a rural village in Limpopo. Being with South Africa is much more for me, is much more than just being acknowledged as being beautiful, bold, uh, and being a healthy woman and being seen as a role model for young women. Yes, it is all those things, but for me, the really crucial part of winning the crown is the platform that being with South Africa gives me. A platform that allows me to, that allows my voice to be amplified and to be heard on a subject matter that is very close to my heart, which is mental well-being. I have personal experience of struggling with mental health from when I was a child to when I was in university and also when I was crowned as Miss South Africa. I know for, sh I know for sure that anyone, irrespective of their standing or where, they, or where they come from, can struggle with mental health. It does not discriminate. Given my experience with mental health issues, I use the platform that I have as Miss South Africa to shift attitudes and to remove the stigma attached to mental health. I have made it my mission to promote mental health, not just in South Africa, but globally. The ancient Greeks believed that mental and physical health were interrelated and that the body and the mind should be in harmony. It was the Greek philosopher Socrates who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. I have often asked myself, what is an unexamined life? And I've come to the realization that pretending that everything is okay, hiding how you feel, is actually having an unexamined life. I call the mind the powerhouse, the tool that can change the narratives and the lives that exist in our societies. For anyone, for any change to come about in our societies, we need to empower the mind, because if we do not, we will live in a society that has low levels of self-awareness. I firmly believe that everything we do begins with the balance between physical and mental health. Being able to look at our lives and own how we feel is the step, first step towards being able to deal with issues of mental health. Looking at what is working in our lives, in our minds and what is not, and being prepared to admit to ourselves and others around us that we might be in trouble. That is how we begin to heal. I grew up in a South African village where conversations about mental health were considered a taboo where people who were suffering from mental health illnesses were tormented, embarrassed, or even vilified. Words like crazy, useless, and stupid were thrown around when describing people living with mental illnesses. My grandparents, even though they could not attain it, knew the importance of empowering their children with education. Today, I stand here as a product of those dreams that were validated by education. I stand here boldly as a strong, empowered woman. To empower the mind of the girl child with education is to build a society of empowered women who will pay it forward, break the harmful cycle and rebuild new and improved pathways to holistic health and well-being. It was through education that I learned about mental health. Education empowered me by giving me the precious gift of critical thinking. Through careful investigation of all subject matter comes open engagement. It is through voicing our opinions and debating them that we can firmly stand within ourselves. We begin to learn the power within our own voices to say no and to know that inherently a no should be respected. Whilst education provides all these things, it is through access to mental health care and mental health education that they become solidified. Education is a necessary platform, but equally is one's mental health, identity and confidence that becomes a house built from a firm foundation. Through education, we debunk unequal gender power dynamics and harmful gender norms that hinder empowerment. 
Education is the key to the economic autonomy of adolescent girls and women and the key to change. The education of adolescent girls and young women is of critical importance everywhere, but especially on the African continent. Education is the key to the promotion of their health as defined by the World Health Organization. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Education affects everything from how we see the world to the decisions that we make about the world that we live in. The World Health Organization's guidelines state that promoting mental health is an integral part of public health. It also stresses that mental health is more, is more, is more than the absence of mental illness, that there's no health without mental health. It has been a revelation that the world is finally opening up to the concept of mental stress. I made myself a promise when I first entered the Miss South Africa pageant that I would, dedicate, I would dedicate my reign to starting the conversation around mental issues of mental health and that I would dedicate my reign to starting a mindful movement. In keeping with my word, as Miss South Africa, I have hosted a series of Instagram live sessions called Mindful Mondays. Each week, I've invited a frontline worker in the mental health field to join me in discussing a host of issues around mental wellness. We've looked at everything from bipolar disorder to anxiety, to depression, to teenage suicides. Nothing has been off limits. Also to make sure that I use my voice as someone who's also su suffered from mental torment and stress, I wrote a book called She Defines Her Magic with the foreword written by Professor Paking about how I was bullied as a child. My fervent hope is that by telling my story, I've made it possible for young people who are being bullied or have been bullied to tell theirs. I want to make one thing very clear. I'm not advocating for superhumans who are so self-examined and so advanced in their thinking and their way of behaving that they're extraordinary. I'm saying that we all need to speak our truth to fully be ourselves, to be our authentic selves, unashamed, of, unashamed that sometimes it might just not be okay. Women particularly are susceptible to feelings, to feelings of being unworthy or feeling less than feeling like we have to work twice as hard just to prove our capabilities and to be held in equal regards as our male counterparts. Women work so hard that they forget to acknowledge their own br brilliance and the pivotal role that they play in society. Women, I have learned through my Mindful Monday sessions, often bear the brunt of carrying the feelings of those around them without being given the time or the space to examine their own. According to research, women are, twice, are nearly twice as likely to suffer from mental illnesses than men. This gender disparity in dep dep depressive disorders may relate to social inequalities and living standards across the nations. Research continues to highlight how the overt social and economic inequalities more commonly experienced by women, such as lower rates of schooling and employment, less pay for similar jobs and underrepresentation in leadership positions and the higher level of psychosocial stresses and problems from caregiving burden to intimate partner violence all contribute to these disparities. If women are to be game changers, thought leaders, if we are to take or better yet create our own seat at the table, it begins with us being, it begins with being in balance, being both mentally and physically healthy. There can only be gender equality when society at large changes the narratives that exist around women and their health in a patriarchal society. It's time for us to stop using phrases such as hysterical, emotional, or neurotic when describing women. Unless the use of such language to describe women is changed, women will always be seen as shrill and out of control when compared to men. This essentially denies them a clear and considered voice and leads them to unacceptable gender stereotyping. Having more people come, coming out and speaking about their own struggles has been particularly important. Last year, Chrissy Teigen, wife of multi-platinum recording artist John Legend, opened up about struggling with postpartum depression after the birth of her first child, Luna. This implored millions around the world, especially women, to share their stories. Earlier this year, 23-year-old Japanese Haitian tennis player Naomi Osaka Japanese most famous athlete spoke, about, spoke out about her struggle uh, with anxiety long before she was asked to light the flame to open the Tokyo Summer Olympic Games. Despite winning the first round at the prestigious event, the French Open, she quit the to to tournament after she was fined for refusing to attend mandatory post-match press conferences. Naomi explained that she had experienced long bouts of depression since winning the 2018 US Open and had often had huge waves of anxiety before speaking to the media. Critics accused her of playing the mental health card. This year, 
The Tokyo Olympic Games further highlighted the importance and prevalence of mental health in our society, even at the highest level. Simone Biles, an economic, uh, an, an Olympic gymnast, withdrew from the Games due to mental distress. She was widely criticized and ultimately characterized as weak and again playing the mental health card, despite the mental and physical imbalance being a danger to her life in a sport like gymnastics. These narratives have to change because it is OK to not be OK. It is OK to remove yourself from some situations and seek help. During my discussions with caregivers at the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, SADC, I have learned that anxiety disorders are the most common. One in five South Africans are affected by men these mental illnesses every year. Unlike my grandmother, unlike when my grandmother was young, today mental health can be treated in a number of ways. It begins with normalizing these conversations in our societies and moving the topic of mental health from being a taboo topic to one that is openly discussed in public forums such as these. Let us bring these conversations into our homes. Let us bring these conversations into our schools. Let us bring these conversations into our communities. My message to women and men who are having a hard time, it is okay to not be okay. It is okay to seek help and you do not have to shy away from seeking help because of the societal narratives of what it means to be strong, especially what it means to be a strong woman. It is time for us to move away from these harmful norms that have shaped our society and have led to the silencing of the voices of women. We all need the ability to open up about the negative thoughts that we are feeling. It does not make us any weaker, it makes us stronger. Happy Women's Day and thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Shudu. Um, it felt like you were talking to me, but I'm sure many women and everyone in the room today had your wise message reminding us it's okay, that it is okay not to be okay. Oftentimes when you're in a leadership position, you don't want to be seen not to be okay. Or in fact, those you lead do not want to see you like you're not okay. So you have to play okay, even when you're not okay. Thank you for the reminder because part of our mental health or our mental well-being is us taking care of ourselves. But also thank you for, you know, you, you, your, the issue of your hair is quite interesting because, you know, hair is political. People, people forget the political nature of hair, that during apartheid, people's race was decided on hair. And so, so your hair, whether you have it or not, uh, and how it looks like it's always political. And taking off your hair is not apolitical either. You're making a statement, you're not your hair. And, and we appreciate you showing that you can be without your hair, still be strong, beautiful, and stand your ground. So thank you very much for who you are, what you represent, and the work that you do. We had your message today. Thank you. Now I will hand over to Dr. Linda Mkwisha, our Executive Director of Research at UCT, who will deliver the closing remarks and vote of thanks. Over to you, Linda. Thank you very much, Betty. And a very good afternoon, everyone. And I'd also like to acknowledge our Chair of Council, Ms. Baba Rangunyama, in our presence. Wow, what a wonderful and beautiful afternoon it's been. We have really been treated to a feast of heartwarming and inspiring messages, so much wisdom, so much knowledge and experiences shared. I'm truly honored to be giving a vote of thanks at the end of this inspiring afternoon. History has shown that with each passing decade, women make significant strides in actualizing their ambitions. And it is deeply gratifying to note and to hear from all our outstanding speakers today that with their success, they embrace and carry out the responsibility to contribute to the upliftment of others. In February 1982, Audre Lorde, a self-described black lesbian, mother, warrior, poet, delivered a powerful address on learning from the 60s as part of the celebration of the Malcolm X weekend at Harvard University. As she was passionately asserting, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And this reality came out quite strongly from some of the speakers today reminding us all that our struggles are not isolated. 
but intertwined and impact on each other. Our day has been a celebration of the unceasing quest for equality, while fully comprehending with some sense of puzzlement why the journey is always not concluded. And this leaves me with a deep sense that we need to continually commit to pursuing this pathway. We heard from a number of dynamic women today. And ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to extend on behalf of the executive leadership and the rest of the UCT community, our deep gratitude to our keynote speaker, Ms. Shudufazo Musida. As reigning Miss South Africa, you stepped into a highly public role during a time of great uncertainty and challenges, not just for students, but for all our people. Yet you set a strong example, especially with younger generations, by advocating for mental health, amplifying women's voices, and stressing the importance of education. Thank you for sharing with the country your special brand of discipline, determination and courage. And for sharing with us today your story and the lessons that you've learned along your journey. And I would like to congratulate you on your recent graduation and the debut book on children, which I believe will be available in multiple languages. I'd also like to extend a special appreciation to our esteemed scholars, Professor Hepgood and Drs. Altieri and Pickering. Thank you for the commitment each of you bring, not only to the academic project at UCT, but also to the transformation of science, research and academia. And equally important, for striving and constantly leveraging on the transformative power of research to make sure that you respond to some of our society's challenges. We are also especially appreciative for the chance to hear from your postgraduate students and postdoctoral fellows about the way their lives are enhanced by being part of your research teams and through your mentorship. And we congratulate them for staying the course during these challenging times and to continue believing in the importance of the work they do. And also most importantly, to remain excited about the work. We wish you all continued success in the year ahead. Professor Pakeng, you set the stage today with insight into the intersectionality of gender inequality and how that affects all of us in the country. May your thoughts bear fruit in helping, in helping us, both men and women, to change how we see each other and work with each other. Thank you, Kheti, for your visionary leadership, which is characterized by a willingness to, to strengthen and challenge those around you you pull us forward and encourage us to participate and grow. And thank you for facilitating and intentionally creating much needed spaces to engage, educate and empower us. The music set a perfect scene and mood for celebrating today. Lady, Big, um, Lady Day Big Band featuring Lana Croster and the UCT School of Dance. Thank you for the joy and energy that you bring to every performance. And so much for the new spark that you ignite in our favorite songs. There's truly nothing like hearing my breeze songs to lift our spirits on a Tuesday afternoon. And a final thank you to my hardworking colleagues in the ICTS and Communications and Marketing Department for their diligence behind the scenes in producing this wonderful program. And in closing, to everyone who's part of this event today, 
I hope you have heard and seen much to be inspired by. I certainly have. And I'm reminded by the words of the poet Mposikomutso Dombo, in I honor you all, which he used in paying tribute to some of our country's greatest leaders. He wrote, you whose minds shaped power, plotting the maps of change, sculptors of tomorrow. So when we choose to disrupt in powerful ways, the course of history can be changed. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for sharing this time with us. And using the ten of phase phrase of Domba the poet, May we become the sculptors of tomorrow and be deliberate about it every day. This now brings us to the end of our program. Go well, stay safe and be healthy. Thank you.